The following is a presentation of Algonquin College Broadcasting. Good evening and welcome to Hot House. My name is Laurie Fife. In the first term of writing for actors, students write a 10 minute play. This format challenges the writer to squeeze all the features of a full length play, plot, character, and theme into a short format. With many festivals devoted to short form writing, a 10 minute play is an essential part of the writer's portfolio. This evening, we bring you readings of eight short plays. The subject matter vary, but please be advised that many of the plays contain mature, mature subject matter and strong language. Viewer discretion is advised. After the first five plays, we will take a break and have a brief Q&A, the first five writers, then re reconvene for the final three readings, after which we will have a Q&A with the final three writers. I want to thank David Grigg, Faculty of Broadcasting, and all the students in broadcasting for guiding us through this new virtual terror territory. Thank you also to Dan Falladen, Academic Chair, Media Studies, and Terry Loretto Valentic, Coordinator for Script Writing and Performing Arts, for their support for this event. Thank you to our playwrights, Samantha Rhodes Mason, Kira Kambatli, Dina Abadi, Amjad Yassim, Charlie Daze, Angelica Shripnock, William Irwin and Alex Eldridge for their imagination and hard work in bringing these stories to life. I also extend my thanks to Hannah Gibson Fraser, our Hot House Artistic Director, a playwright and actor, a graduate of Algonquin College, and a professor in the Performing Arts Program. Hannah has guided our actors through the rehearsal process. Thank you to everyone involved in Hot House for your patience and your talent. And thank you to you, our audience, for joining us online for this presentation. Enjoy. And now I turn things over to Hannah Gibson Fraser. Thank you so much, Lori, for that wonderful introduction. Welcome, everyone, to our second virtual Haas workshop presentation. My name is Hannah Gibson. And Fraser, a professor of performing arts and artistic director of Hot House. For the lag, apparently my internet is choosing to be funny right now, a little bit awkward, but wouldn't be live if we didn't have it. So each year, uh, we have our Hot House series of staged readings for the script writing students. This event offers a chance for the script writing students to hear their work come to life in front of a live audience, that's you, and for them to receive feedback from yourself, the actors, and me, of course. Each play you're about to see is a work in progress. Where many edits took place during the preparation process, more will continue to happen after the production. Actors are typically are, are informed about their character through dialogue, grammar, tone, and overall rhythm of a piece. So it's important to create distinctive voices that are different from our own. Hearing the words come to life allows the writer an opportunity, allowing for growth of character and play. And that's what makes Hot House so special. The writers get to work with self and other local artists to bring voices to life. So this process takes place over two short rehearsals with tight editing deadlines for the main event. Each equipped with the most recent updated version of the script, which they'll read from throughout the evening. So usually, of course, this would take place in our beloved N112 uh, Black Box Theatre at Algonquin, but given the restrictions of on campus, the television broadcasting program has made it possible from the safety of comfort. I'll move on without introducing the performers who have 
from this evening possible as well by volunteering countless hours in bringing these characters to life. First, I would like to welcome Chantel Roy, local writer, actor, maker, and alumni of uh, script writing and performing arts. We have Rosalia Red, performing arts graduate, singer, actor, social media influencer. Jamie Sadgrove, musical theater performer and producer, and works as an advocate for trans inclusion and visibility. Xander Storm, performing arts graduate, actor, and social media influencer. Mark Templin, a recent retiree who decided to focus on screenwriting and has now caught the acting bug. And Vincent Valentino has created over 400 short films and is currently working on his fifth feature. And then myself, Hannah Gibson Fraser. So after the first five shows of the evening, we will have a brief Q&A with our writers uh, here this evening, led by Lori Fife, and then we'll take a brief 10 minute intermission. And then after intermission, we will proceed to the final three remaining shows for another and then another Q&A period. Please keep note of any questions and comments you have for the writers. And if snacks and drinks ready, great. So now I'd like to welcome our first playwright of the evening, Alex Elvidge. Hi everyone, my name is Alex Elvidge and in my play, Ron and Marty at the Pearly Gates, St. Peter is having a hectic day. The paperwork is backed up, his boss is yapping away in his ear, and he is a lineup of the recently deceased waiting to be let into the afterlife. The last thing he needs is Ron and Marty Walsh, an elderly couple who seem intent on delaying the start of the eternal paradise. Enjoy the play. A set of large gates of wrought iron and gold stand at stage right, surrounded by shimmering clouds. St. Peter stands at a lectern, flipping through a massive ledger. He wears a wireless headset. An elderly couple, Ron and Marty, enter. Oh, look, hon. We did it. Uh, hi. You're early. No, no, I'm late. Forgive me. I'm running a bit behind schedule here. Um, names, please? Marty and Ron Walsh. Okay, just wait one moment while I find you here. Okay, Vaughn, Vernon, here we are. Walsh Ronald, born 1938 in Chattanooga, Tennessee, husband to Martha Walsh, nay Franklin. Marty. Okay, Marty Walsh, born the next year in Knoxville, Tennessee. Renette Malkovista. Right. Okay, sorry. It looks like we're a little backed up. I don't see your death paperwork here. Busy time of year for me. The holidays, you understand. Sure. You seem like sweet folks. I'm sure there won't be any issue. We're actually struggling to fill up capacity in here these days. I just have to cover my bases. Would you mind just telling me a bit about yourselves? Oh, of course. I'm, I'm a retired school teacher, but I have been lazing around these last few years. I still volunteer at the local hospital on the weekends, which I used to. And, and Ron, well, he's done all sorts. He's been a writer, a volunteer firefighter. He was even a crossing guard for a while. Any kids? Oh, none of our own. Though we did foster for a time, weren't those just the sweetest kids, hon? They stole my cigarettes. And how was your involvement in the church? Oh, we were there every Sunday. I sung in the choir. I was on the charity draft committee. We raised over a thousand dollars. And you, Ron? Yep, I said all the words. I ate the body and the blood and whatever. Well. This all sounds great. Now, technically, I'm supposed to wait until we have the official paperwork detailing the manner of death and all that. But you seem pretty salt to the earth. I'm going to let you through. 
uh, are you sure? You ain't gotta fact check us or nothing. No, I trust you. St. Peter steps aside to let them through the pearly gates. Marty goes to walk through, but Ron doesn't budge. Ron, not now, please. Is there something wrong? Oh, my husband's afraid of dying. Oh, we see that all the time. Good news is, the hard part's over. You're already dead. You never have to be afraid again. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. Sorry? It ain't so much the dying, it's the afterward. Um, I'm not sure I get your meaning, but if you'll just walk through those gates, I'm sure you'll find wherever you're looking Come on, hon. This ain't some hobby you're picking up and then gonna want to drop after a few weeks. This is paradise. You'll love it. Let's go. I don't know. What's it like in there? <sighs> it's different for everyone. It's whatever you want it to be. Eternal happiness. Yeah, that's the part that irks me. See, I, I ain't ever started something that I ain't gotten bored of quick. I've been through more jobs than you can count. I can't stand the thought of doing anything for too long. Well, how could you not want to spend forever in eternal happiness? Y'all ever had a homemade banana cream pie? <laughs> there, there will be all sorts of desserts inside. You have that first bite and you think you ain't never going to get sick of it. But then before you know it, you can't stomach another bite. See, I don't think I could enjoy anything forever, no matter how good it is. Not even forever with me. Not even with my own self. Well, Mr. Walsh, we like to accommodate all our guests. So if you don't want eternity, you won't have it. Now, if you'll just head on through, I can move on to the next. No, 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 no wait a minute. See, that, that sounds just a little unfair to me. Why should I get a shorter paradise than everybody else? Um, but you just said... And then what happens when it's over? Uh, if my paradise ain't forever, what happens when it ends? Ain't this supposed to be the after? If mine has an end, what's after it? Nothing? Lights out just like that and nothing? Because that's almost as frightening as eternity. That's eternal nothingness. And surely my paradise wouldn't give me that. Because it's supposed to be what I want, right? Sorry, one moment, please. Uh-huh. Okay, I'm getting word that there's a line forming outside. We're going to have to move this along. Wait, now. If Ron doesn't get an eternal afterlife, and I do, doesn't that mean I gotta suffer through the death of my husband again? How the hell is that paradise for me? Ma'am, I watch your language. You're not inside yet. Run, please, for the love of... Mm, let's just go in now. I ain't going in there until I know what I'm walking into. Just tell me what we're going, what we're doing here. I, what is this going to be for me? I need an end. Sir, I promise you, if you just head on in... You ever read Plato? Oh, for God's sake! Ma'am! Plato talked about how when we die, we drink from this river that makes us forget, and then we start all over. Now I'm thinking that must be what my paradise is. I die, I'm reborn, I die again over and over into infinity. But what about me? But then what? I'm going to suffer the hardships of life over and over again? Learn from mistakes I've already made while everybody else is getting happy forever? That don't sound like paradise to me. That sounds like life. That sounds like recycling. That is enough. You are never satisfied with anything. I've tried to be the perfect wife to you. I let you move us from house to house. I took care of us financially every goddamn... <gasps> goddamn time you got bored and quit your job to start fresh someplace else. I never complained that you're constant cycling through hobbies, bringing in piles of Russian nesting dolls and broken down motor cars, whatever else to appease that unceasing boredom of yours. And you know what else? I found the letter you wrote to your brother in Memphis, you no good bootlicking piece of Oh, you Marty. <coughs> Marty. After all I did for you, even a loving wife wasn't enough to keep you happy. No, you always gotta have it all, don't you, Ron? Well, this time you ain't got a choice. 
You ain't leaving. You're stuck with me now. I'm a damn well sure of that. Um, pardon? What? F forgive me. <laughs> Maybe I misheard. It's been such a busy day, and I've got my boss yakking away in my ear. Did you say you made sure of it? I am only man. I... Ah, oh, finally. Your death papers. Huh. That's odd. What is? Well, I have two different manners of death listed here. Since you arrived at the same time, I figured you died in the same accident. Or, you know, since you're old, I figured, you know. But yeah, I think it was just a couple bad oysters. Our immune systems ain't what they used to be. Come on, hon, time to go. Yeah, no, it, it does list food poisoning as the cause of death for both of you. But the manner, it says Ron was murdered. How does that make sense? Come on, Ronald. Murdered? Marty? Fine, fine. He's old. He wouldn't have lasted that much longer anyway. I couldn't let him divorce me. <laughs> oh, no. I need us to be husband and wife in the eyes of the Lord. So we're past on so that we can go enter paradise together. So what if I help the process along a little bit? I did it so we could be together, Ron, so that you could finally be happy. Huh. Close call. Though, the cursing and the wrath were probably enough to get your ticket revoked anyway. Murder-suicide is pretty high up on the list of don'ts as well. I just... God, excuse my language. I just really root for you people to get in. It's really quite wonderful in there. Into his can we get some? Can we get somebody from security up here? A security angel enters. Oh, you're already here. Man, you guys are quick. Yeah, her. That no, 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 no. This Please, this is a mistake. I was only trying to save us, Ron. The security angel drags a kicking Marty no. away. No! Okay. Are we ready to go in? Well, where's she going? I don't think you need to hear about that right now. I think I'm entitled to know. Hmm. It's sort of like a purgatory. Your wife will suffer for however long it takes for her to repent and learn from her mistakes. And then what? And then her position will be reevaluated. So she won't be there forever? Oh, no. All humans are given the opportunity to learn from their mistake and earn their spot. It's company policy. Don't you think you should have laid out that option from the start? What option? Sounds to me like that's the only place that don't go on and on. I wouldn't have to be there forever. But Ron, you don't want to be there. Who are you to say where I do or don't want to be? You want to suffer indefinitely with the wife who murdered you instead of entering paradise, which I'm giving you the opportunity to do right now. I ain't saying I do. I ain't saying I don't. I just like to be given the choice. That's all. Fine. Go. Stay. I don't care. Well? I'm thinking. Geez, keep your drawers on. End of play. Next up, we have Fate by Amjad Yassin. After dealing with failing financial issues, Diggory is brought by Charlie to meet businessman Angel. Can Angel fix Diggory's problems? And what will be the price? Day, the interior of Ajal's office. The walls are white, the table and chairs black. On the table is an open laptop and printer. 
Through an upstage window, we can see a fog-shrouded cemetery. An upstage door leads outside. The door is painted black. A trail of incense floats through the air. A jaw appears behind the laptop, wearing a white suit with a black bow tie, knocking at the door. Come in. Enter Charles. He wears a black suit and a medical face mask. Mr. Diggory Connery is here to see you. Thank you, Charles. Show him in. Enter Diggory. He is dressed in a gray sweater, denim jeans, white beaten up shoes. He also wears a face mask. Boss, don't be too hard on him. He's very stressed. Ajal continues typing on their laptop, briefly glances at Diggory. What can I do for you, Mr. Diggory? Good morning, Mrs. Ajal. I expected someone older. You're very young for someone so successful. Please, make yourself comfortable. If you would like something to drink, it's on the right. I'll be finished in a few minutes. Um, Jaw closes their laptop and leans in, looking at Diggory. I'm surprised you're not wearing a face mask. Mr. Diggory, you're wearing a face mask, so you'll be fine. What can I help you with today? I don't know how you're going to fix my problem. Well, will I have to take out a loan to pay you? If it means get what I want, I'll do it. <sighs> There is no material fee I want from you. I just need you to sign a document. The way I work is this. I will help you achieve anything you wish, but in return, you'll owe me a little favor. And when I come to you for that favor, you will grant it. No questions asked. Really? You don't know. I specialize in helping people like yourself, people who want something done. Something they can't get any other way, except through me. You can call me the wizard. My motto is, I make dreams come true. A favor I will owe you, eh? Can you explain that part? Simple. I will take care of your problems, and you will owe me a favor. If you ask me what kind of favor right now, I can't say, since I don't need anything. Okay, I'm ready. All right, here we go. Mr. Diggory, sign this document and you can be on your way. Diggory takes a pen out of his jacket. Oh, Mr. Diggory, please. Use my pen. Thank you. And I forgot to ask who referred you to me. Well, your assistant told me about you. I met him in the park this morning. He saw me sitting and I guess he saw that I was stressed, so he, well... Charles, yes. He is a great guy. He sure loves to help people in need. But hey, I'm glad to be able to help you. Your problems get solved and I get another favor. That works for me. All right, let's hear your story, Diggory. Uh, it's Dig. Dig, interesting nickname. Let's hear your story. Well, I, it was uh, 1999. I was director of Chime. I worked with two other directors. I made the decisions and led the company into the new millennium. I admit it was ruthless and I didn't have time for weaklings, but if someone couldn't do their job, they were coming. And because of that, I guess, well, because of complaints from staff, other directors set me up. You know, I lost my position. Being a leader, a leader is all I can think of. I neglected my family and friends. I lived, ate, and breathed a chime. Now those new directors are claiming the success I achieve as theirs. But it's because of me that Chime is still leading the industry to this day. They are number one in this world. And I want my light back. I want Chime. And I want those two directors out of there. Mrs. Jal, can you do this for me? There is nothing I cannot do. Your wishes will be taken care of. No worries, Diggory. Trust me. No worries. What are the names of the directors? Uh, Mr. Short and Mr. Little, <laughs> I want them to pay for everything. They were behind the controversies, controversies, they were behind the hate, even the death threats. Wow. Is that all of the tale I need to hear? <laughs> They're both cowards and thieves. Yeah, that's all. We'll fix this in no time. You'll be back to where you want to be, I guarantee it. Okay, good, good. 
Um, could you look at my notes and see if I got anything wrong? Oh, looks all right to me. Okay. Um, so I must ask, wasn't Chime the company that created the evolutionary 1999 video game, Don Car the Fencer? Oh, yeah. But can we get back to our deal? I want my life back. Okay, okay. Calm down. There's no need to stress yourself up. Don't rush the process degree. We'll get there when everything's been covered. So let's say you get the life you want back. What would you do? Celebrate or go to work? Oh, well, shouldn't it be obvious? Continue our lift off and chime. Make it the big bucks. What else? Sounds good to me. It's your life after all. I think we have everything. Fine. Fine. Thank you, Mr. Deary. Um, second thing. Since we finished with the details, I need to warn you that when I start working, there is no backing out. You cannot change your mind. Is that clear? So I am asking you again to confirm your wish, Mr. Degree. This will be your final chance to back out of this fix. I will not be responsible for the side effects of the fix on your new life. People like you lack the foresight to see what your real future could have in store even if you do get in everything you desire. A so Joel hints degree of contract. So you can sign the second copy of our contract and it is yours to read and keep. And you can use your pen this time. Degree signs the contract, not looking at what he's signing. All right. What now? Are we done? When are you going to let me know? I believe your work here is done, Diggory. I will let you know in 48 hours. Just sit tight and be patient. One more thing. Hmm. Do not tell anyone that you came to. It is very important that you say nothing. They shake hands. Well, it really has been interesting. I don't believe in all my years I've ever met anyone like you. Well, thank you for taking me on, and I really appreciate this. Tonight, Diggory, I will start working on your problem. Charles will show you out. You don't want to get lost in here. <laughs> Diggory puts his jacket on. Enter Charles. Mr. Diggory, if you will follow me, please. Mm -hmm. I hope, Mr. Diggory, that Ms. Ajal could help you with your problems. Yeah, yeah, she was great. She promised to help me within 48 hours. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Charles. Have a good day. Exit Diggory. He's gone. You sure picked a winner. He is really ready to do whatever it takes. <laughs> Poor sucker. <laughs> Nothing is ever free. Mm. Ajal crosses to the window and looks out over the graveyard. Charles closes the door. Ajal closes their laptop. Blackout. We hear the sound of the entire building collapsing. Now we have work to do and a party to plan. We will let him enjoy the fix. Then after some time, I will need a favor from him. Now what should I ask for? Decisions, decisions. Actually, Charles, since you were the one who suggested Diggory to me, I'll let you decide. <laughs> <laughs> End of play. My name is Angelica Skrnak, and I wrote The Curse Upon Me. Lydia, a high school student, finds herself within the story of the Lady of Shalott by Alfred Lord Tennyson, and attempts to prevent the fair maiden's tragic death. Is love at first sight, love or lust? Lydia sits at a school desk. She reads a book. Off stage, a teacher speaks. Today's reading is The Lady of Shalott by Alfred Lord Tennyson. On either side of the river lie long fields of barley and of rye. 
Lydia folds her arms and falls asleep on the open book. A half wall distinguishes the interior of the Shalott Tower. A small wooden boat sits upstage. Sitting by a loom, Elaine pokes a Lydia with a broom. Lydia awakes. Back you stay. Wait, where am I? Broom, and you appear here to curse me yourself? Curse? Answer me, witch. Witch? I'm not a witch. Is my isolation not to your approval? I'm not a witch. You're a witch. Not, where am You're I? You're not a witch? Prove it. How? Are you made of wood? No. Flesh. Your nose is all right. A little long. No moles. What's your name? Lydia. Lydia of... Of? Where are you from? Oh, Ottawa. But I was just at St. Peter's High. Lydia of Ottawa. Such a strange word it is. Ottawa. Is it like Camelot? Camelot? Yes, Camelot. Oh, Camelot. Oh. How Elaine I looks into the mirror by her loom. How I wish to see you walk amidst the pebble streets, catch a glimpse, of a glance of a trotting knight. You're the Lady of Shalott. Yes, that is I, or Elaine. Reapers call me the fairy. They like my song. Oh, keep your head down. What? What? The, the curse. We must look down at Camelot. What is the curse? Oh, I haven't a clue, but it's a curse nonetheless. So you sit here all day? Isn't that a curse? I weave what I see. Loyal knights, fair maidens, giddy newlyweds, they pass on a glimpse I get. I'm half sick of shadows. So, do you have a man? <laughs> uh, not exactly. <gasps> there is someone. Do share. What is he like? Uh, well, he's tall, handsome, sporty. Every girl in class kind of likes him. Does he take you by the hand through the field and recite poetry to you? Ooh, or have your image deep behind his... Uh, no. Well, why not? I don't think he even knows I exist. Token? Well, we've made eye contact. I think he smiled at me once. Oh, do you him? Oh, I'm not sure about that four-letter word. Sir Lancelot enters. He clicks coconuts and acts as though he rides a horse. Oh my! Who oh is my. it? What is it? He's like no other. His head uh, as though a burning flame curly locks it's coal black tearily rock tearily rock oh hear him sing i cannot bear it elaine rushes to the window and watches sir lancelot trot off stage oh the, the curse is upon me 
I am in love. You never spoke to him. Oh, oh, it doesn't matter. My heart aches for him. If you're the Lady of Shalott, he's Sir Lancelot. Sir Lancelot. <sighs> no, don't Sir Lancelot. He doesn't like you. He loves Guinevere. He loves another? The king's wife. Well, how do you know he does not love me? My heart beats only for him. P please, trust me. He isn't all that great. Oh, I must go down to Camelot. Elaine grabs a lantern and rushes around the wall to a boat. Lydia follows. Wait! Ah! <sighs> Think this through. What are you going to do? Well, I have to be near him. Each moment that passes burdens my soul. Why don't we wait for another night? I'm sure one will be trotting by. Any second. Sir, Lan Sir Lancelot is the one and only. There is none other than he. You can't fall in love with the guy you've never met. You only like the idea of him. Elaine unties the boat and steps on. Down to Camelot. Yes, Camelot. Don't go. He's just going to break your heart. He's not all what he seems. But what if he loves me? I cannot suppress this feeling. I have never felt so strongly for one before. He's also the first guy you've ever laid eyes on. Love at first sight doesn't always work. This isn't a fairy tale. Well, this isn't a Disney fairy tale. I am going down to Camelot. He will see my face. Why don't you wait until tomorrow? Maybe in the morning you can hitch a ride with a knight and, you know, fall in love with someone who will actually love you. I cannot wait another minute. Elaine pushes off and lies down in the boat. You're going to freeze to death. The lantern is the only light. The boat slowly follows the stream down to the front of the stage while Elaine sings. Elaine dies, frozen mid-song. Lydia stands to the side, shivering. Sir Lancelot walks on stage with a lantern and approaches the boat. Sir Lancelot exits. Lydia draws near and looks down at Elaine. Was it worth it? Lydia blows out the lantern. Recess bell rings. She wakes at her school desk. End of play. Hey there everyone, my name is Charlie Daze and I am the playwright of Grey, where under the care of two therapists who just so happen to be ghosts in an undead realm, Grey navigates the changing relationship with their family as a trans person who's fresh out of the closet. Thanks so much for watching and I hope you all enjoy. Thunder rumbles and lightning of an odd color flickers. A crash lights up on gray, apprehensive. A dilapidated couch and armchair are seen. Oh, well, that felt supernatural. Uh, Grandpa? Uh, 
Ugh, no, that's not helpful. <sighs> okay, not dead. I think. Where am I? I had just gotten to Grandpa's house. It must have been struck by lightning. But unless I'm horribly unobservant, it's never looked like a creepy-ass haunted house. Thunder rumbles and lightning flashes once more as Bones and Gallo emerge behind Gray. Gallo moves frequently and sporadically. Bones remains still and stoic. Let's see. Next up is... Oh? Look at this one, Bones. Look at this one. Um, yes, Gallo. It's rather impossible to miss our client here. Who the hell are you two? You know, I was expecting a bit more of an enthusiastic response to our presence, such as... Gallo pokes Gray. Ah, oh, this one's alive! Really? Whatever tipped you off? Uh, uh, alive? Are you two not... Not in the slightest, no. You're in a realm occupied by the undead, young one. How is that remotely possible? Wait, um, am I? Dead? No. It would seem you've been sent here under a series of rather rare requirements. Those being? The need to resolve personal crisis with the aid of a licensed therapist and a timely strike of lightning on the roof of your grandfather's house. I have no idea how to respond to that. Yeah, someone's got daddy issues. <laughs> oh, quiet. To provide a little more context, we offer therapy service for the undead. And once in a blue moon for those lucky enough to cross into our realm. So, your ghost shrinks? Mm -hmm. well, that's one way of putting it, yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't believe for a second that Gallo here has the abilities to help anyone. <laughs> oh, Gallo makes a remarkable therapist, actually. But I have a feeling you two won't be a great fit. I'll be the one to provide your counseling. N no, wait. I don't consent to this. I want to go home. Not possible. You need to resolve whatever it is that's bogging you down. Only then will the door open for you to return to the realm of the living. I'm sure you know that there are laws that allow me to refuse care. We, we don't subscribe to laws here. I'm under no obligation to trust you. What else have you to lose in this situation, really? Plenty. Look, you're stuck here with no manner of leaving except through the confrontation of your own troubles. Whatever they are, they will be key to you leaving this place. You must share them. No. What good will it do? For all I know, you could be transphobic as well. Ah. There it is. You have nothing to fear on that front. The dead don't discriminate. I want a licensed therapist who's trained in trans-affirming healthcare. <laughs> good luck finding that. <laughs> Why is this happening to me? Who initiated something like this? That would be the big guy. The who now? You may know him as the Lord Almighty, among other names. Oh, that big guy. Yeah, we don't hear from him too often. He just sends along souls in precarious places, I guess. And we take care of the rest. <laughs> right, Bones? It's occurred to me that I didn't catch your name nor your pronouns. Oh, it's Gray. They, them pronouns. Gallo, fetch my clipboard and get them some sort of stress object as well, please. Gallo leaves. Gray, I implore you to give this a chance. Oftentimes, a simple chat is more than enough to clear the path forward. Fine. Only because I see no other option right now. Wonderful. Have a seat on the couch. Gray sits on the couch. Bone settles in the armchair. Gallo enters with a clipboard for Bones and a stress ball for Gray. All right, let me begin. Where do you feel we should start? I want to go home. You will return home once you've overcome whatever's burdening you. That won't be possible. 
My parents just kicked me out a few hours ago, and I'm one conversation away from my grandpa doing the same thing. Okay. Well, that sounds like an excellent starting point. What's the current state of the relationship with your grandfather? Uh, it's great. <laughs> it's always been great. Hmm. You say that like it's a bad thing. Well, it's about to be destroyed as soon as I find a way out of here. And why do you say that? I speak from experience. Coming out to your parents didn't go well? Considering I'm now forced to endure this mandated therapy, no. No, it did not. It's a tough one, pal. They refused to use my pronouns. Ah! As well as my correct name. That's the worst. And then they threw me out, never to return unless I change my radical ways. Throw them in jail. Oh, up, please. Sorry. If my parents reacted so strongly, I can damn well expect the same from my grandpa. Well now, what did you say to your parents during the initial reaction? I didn't get the chance to say much of anything. I see. If you don't mind, Gray, I'd like to try an exercise with you. Mm -hmm. An exercise? Yes, Gallo, sit on the couch next to Gray. Now, I want you to picture Gallo as one of your parents. Do I have to? Just try it. Tell them whatever it is you need to say. Uh, hey, parent. Can we continue our chat from before? Is this really the best time? <laughs> well, yesterday in the car wasn't a particularly affirming conversation, and neither was this evening at the dinner table. So might as well try now while I'm trapped in this haunted nightmare of a house. It's clear I need to spell it out for you. It is transphobic to purposefully misgender me. Yeah, that's right. I pulled out the T word. You said earlier you don't understand it, but the singular they pronoun has been around since the 14th century. That's hundreds of years for English speakers to get acquainted with they and them, which apparently hasn't been enough time. I promise it's really not that hard. In fact, I can guarantee you already know how to use them. Gray stands and throws their wallet on the ground. Oh no, somebody dropped their wallet on the ground. Gray picks up the wallet and opens it. Hmm, no ID, but there's a hundred bucks in here. I bet they'll really miss it. See? Not hard at all. These pronouns shouldn't confuse anyone because they're already in everyone's vocabulary. People get mad when you misgender their dog, but they don't bat an eyelash misgendering a trans person. The excuse that it's hard is just transphobia manifesting as denial and fake ignorance. And why do you continue to flinch at that word? I can see you're uncomfortable discussing this. That's good, because I'm uncomfortable being misgendered. And since I live through that every day, you can deal with a few minutes of temporary discomfort to learn how to treat someone different than you with basic dignity. I'm not doing this to make your life difficult. I'm doing this to be happy, to feel comfortable. Because right now, I am miserable. You know how the fire alarm went off all the time while we were cooking in our old house? And, fine, and it was just chaos as we rushed to turn the damn thing off? And finally, once it was off and the house regained normalcy, you know the quiet we felt afterwards? That's what the correct pronouns feel like for me. All I want is for this alarm to stop blaring in my brain. You weren't kidding about the daddy issues. Yeah, I spotted that a mile away. You got a lot of angst in there, don't you, pal? Vocalizing it won't change anything. Thunder rumbles and lightning flickers. A light shines, drawing everyone's attention. Gray, are you in there? What? Huh? Uh, Grandpa? Grandpa Great. enters. There you are. My, what a dang place this is. Excuse me? Hey, man, that's all called for. How do you know my name is Gray? 
Your father just mentioned it over the phone. Oh. I hung up on him shortly after. That man could never say a kind thing to anyone. Now, are you all right? Um, I'm good. Uh, are you okay? Well, I'm just dandy now that I found you here, wherever you might be. G Grandpa, do you n not hate me? Why on earth would I hate you? <laughs> no reason. Gray, have you noticed just how boring our family is? <laughs> of course I have. No one pushes boundaries or expands their circles. And quite frankly, no one is being themselves. You, on the other hand, are being exactly who you were meant to be. How could I hate you for that? I, I wasn't sure how you'd react. Then let me be clear. You take your time, but whatever you need to say, and whenever you need to say it, I will always be here for you, Craig. This is so good. Now, while I'm fairly certain that I'm hallucinating this place, what say we head home? Yeah, I like. Let's go. A light shines again. Gray and Grandpa stand. Oh, a satisfying ending. So long. Thanks, you too. Oh, that was easy. Thunder rumbles and lightning flickers in the distance. A crash. Oh, another one's here already? Huh. All right. Who's up next? Oh, it's a live one again. Someone named Elliot Page. I loved him in Juno. Yeah. Yeah. End of play. Cold Feet by Dina Abadi. Three days prior to the wedding, bride-to-be and social media influencer, Eileen is having bridal nerves. She confesses to her friends the real reason she said yes. To what extent will maintaining a perfect online identity affect her reality? Eileen is sitting on the couch and scrolling through her phone. She's wearing her thick winter socks. <clears throat> A little selfie. Okay, no, not that angle. <clears throat> Ugh, no. Okay, I need a filter. Perfect. Ding dong. Coming. Ding dong. I'm coming. I'm coming. Ding dong. Ding dong. Oh my God. I said I'm coming. Just one second. <sighs> Enter my Rosa goodness. and Maria. <sighs> what in the world are you doing? What took you so long? Hmm? Oh, I'm just editing a selfie. Okay, can we come in? Why am I even asking? Come in, Maria. So, how's our bride to be? Eileen, please get off your phone and come sit with us. Just, just wait one, one second. I'm posting to Instagram. Oh my God, are you going okay. to be doing this on your wedding day? I think we should hide her phone on that day. Eileen puts down her phone and sits on the couch with her friends. Oh, finally. Oh, oh, oh you know what? Just one song. Okay, let's take one. Okay, ready? 
okay, no, wait, one more, one more. <clears throat> okay, no, 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 stop, stop, we're done. Okay, fine, bye. Um, come on, we're here to sit here. <sighs> Guess what? My dress is ready. I picked it up this morning from the seamstress. It fits perfectly now. And I just came back from the hairdresser. I finally chose my hairstyle for the wedding. Oh, I can't wait. Hello, Eileen. Are you listening to us? Huh? Hmm? Oh, you're not even with us. Okay, so we were saying, hey, why are you wearing winter socks on a warm day? I thought you hated wearing socks. this morning oh no you can't get sick now three more days until the wedding oh no I'm not I'm not sick it's just that I'm not feeling well what's wrong yeah tell us what's going on you know just the wedding's coming soon yeah it's really soon I'm so excited okay Maria wait let Eileen tell us what's wrong. This is not the face of a happy bride. Yeah, <sighs> I, I don't know, guys. I, I, I might have made just a quick decision saying yes. Oh, uh, but I just I feel things are going a little too quickly. It would, I've rushed into getting. Married. Why would you say yes to marrying him in the first place, then? Uh, to be honest, I mean, he's a Tame's a really good guy. Uh, we've been together for a year and a half now, and I really like him. Okay. But I also love the idea of a proposal and wearing engaged. But they, at the time when people were around me, were announcing their engagements, weddings, pregnancies, and I'd see all these photos of all these happy people, and I was figured, why not me? Oh, please, Eileen, this is not a reason to say yes to marriage. Marriage isn't just changing your Facebook status to engaged or married and putting photos of the two of you together online. It's it's a whole life ahead of you. I don't think I'm ready for the responsibility that marriage brings. I'm not ready to start a family. I mean, I'm really not sure I even want to commit yet. But wait. You guys look like the happiest couple in the world. Look at your Facebook and Instagram feed. Yeah, well, that's Instagram and Facebook. It's not real life. What do you mean it's not real life? Aren't you posting happy moments from your life? Come on. This is social media. I'm an influencer with thousands of followers. I'm confused. So you're not sure you want to commit yet, but the other day you posted this photo showing the whole world how gleeful, grateful, and fortunate you are to be together? It's a picture. It's not the real picture. Not the real picture? What? Look, I get it. I love posting photos, receiving likes and comments, but posting something that doesn't reflect reality? That's something else. Guys, look, it doesn't matter. Eileen, I knew you weren't posting real life stuff, but I never imagined it would lead you to this. I should have warned you earlier. You know what? I wasn't sure whether or not I should disclose this, but I think you should know. Know what? Yesterday, Tame spoke to me. He was saying the same thing. He thinks he made a quick decision and he's not ready for marriage yet. He mentioned that he, what, well, he was you, saying- Are you telling me this now? You're my friend. Okay, calm down, Eileen. You know, Tame is my cousin and he talks to me whenever he feels down uh, or disoriented. It's normal to feel nervous right before the wedding. He told me he'd speak to you. Yeah? Well, he didn't. And he hasn't been himself lately. 
I'm not gonna let him dump me right before the wedding. What do what my followers think? I can't believe this. Look, both of you are just nervous. Maybe you need some more time and maybe you should postpone the wedding. We already sent out the wedding invitations. What will the 200 plus people that we invited? Uh, how about the thousands of followers on my social media? Talk to him, then see what you can do. Well, he's not picking up. Not picking up! Ah! Great! Now he sent me a voicemail. Ah! Okay. Mm, now I get it. On February 23rd at 11.07 p.m., a photo, he posted a photo. And on March 1st, he sh Why did you tell her this now? I don't know. I thought she would feel better knowing that she's not the only one feeling this way. She's crazy. You know that. I mean... Eileen's phone starts ringing. Oh, now he's calling. Is it true that you told Rosa? You're nervous and you're not ready at all. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh, so you really think you should postpone the wedding? No, no, I can't do this. No, look, you're a great guy, all right? I won't let you do this to me. No, 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 no. I'm the one calling it off. The wedding is off. I'm breaking up with you. Tell everyone I ended it. No, I, en I ended it. Hello? Hello? No! Oh, he hung up on me. How dare he? What? Why are you looking at me like that? Oh, my God. What did you just do? Nothing. I mean, I'm calling off the wedding, but we broke up. Are you crazy? Okay, wait, you okay? what am I going to say? Uh, what, what, what am I going to say? We postponed the wedding because we're not ready to commit? Or, or what about all these romantic photos of us? All the lovey-dovey statuses? Our cheesy comments to each other? Oh my god, I'm going to look like a fool. It's humiliating just last minute. I would rather, I would rather end it. I, you know what? I, it makes more sense just to end it. Are you serious? The man was just asking you to postpone the wedding. Well, if he's nervous and, and maybe even uncertain now, what if people found out he needed more time? People, people, people. Who cares what people are going to say? Wait, 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 wait. Let me do this before he does. Do what? I don't get it. Rosa, is she serious? She just ended it with him like that? No more wedding? I'm so off. I don't know. I don't understand why she did this. Rosa's phone rings. Who is it? It's Tame. Hello? Hey, hey Tame. Yes, I heard. N no. What? What's going on? Did you just dump him on Facebook? Oh, no. I can't believe this. I'm so sorry, Tam. Oh, you have a call waiting? Okay, call me. Call me later then. Eileen, why did you just change your relationship status to single? I had to do this. There's not much time left. People have to know that I did it. People have to know I dumped him. I don't want people to pity me, so I did it before he did. Why does it matter that people know? Of course it matters. I care about my image. Well, in case you haven't realized, the perfect image you're trying to create online has nothing to do with the real you. Rosa's phone rings. 
It's Tame again. Hi, hello? Yes, Tame. Oh. oh, okay. I'll let her know. What does he want? He said the wedding venue just called him. They announced that due to COVID-19, the city will be in lockdown and all weddings are canceled. And they said your wedding got postponed until further notice. Oh, no. Wow, the timing. <gasps> but it's too late now. You've dumped him in front of the entire world online. All three girls receive a notification on their phones. Tame's going live. Oh, no. What's he going to do? Hi, everyone. So, today... I've just had the worst breakup ever. And here's my story. End of play. Okay, thank you to all our writers and actors. That was our first half, the first five plays. Uh, before we take a brief break, an intermission, we're going to uh, have a little Q&A. And first up will be Alex Elridge. Uh, Ron and Marty at the Pearly Gates. Is Alex there? Hi, Alex. Hi, So, yeah, So I've got a couple of questions that have come up. And one of them is, uh, this is so such a fascinating play because it's based on our idea of what the afterlife is like. So is, were you thinking of anything in particular, speculating on the afterlife when you wrote this play? Um, I guess so. I mean, I, I guess I uh, established the world of the afterlife based on a very common conception um, that we have of the afterlife in the Western world. Um, but the idea for Ron's fear of the afterlife, I think came from my own fear of what happens after we die, which is a fear of the unknown. Yeah, and, and that comes across as this idea that he, he questions it, even this idea that paradise could ever be interesting enough to, to find yourself in an eternity of something that's wonderful could also be boring. Um, did this, was this inspired by anyone you know who might have questioned with you or influenced your attitude about the idea that, well, they weren't terribly interesting in our typical idea of paradise? Any, um, anybody come the, to mind? <laughs> the idea for, um, for the play came from a conversation that I had with uh, someone in my life a few years ago who uh, was trying to explain to me how wonderful uh, paradise could be because it, in, uh, in her idea of paradise, it's, uh, it's dependent on the person. So it's whatever you want. But for me, the idea of anything going on for eternity was absolutely terrifying. And so I thought, you know, how could they possibly create a, a, a paradise for me that that could suit my fear of anything going on for too long? And that's kind of how I came up with the uh, with the character of Ron and his fear. I'm going to ask you, um, because I get the feeling you enjoyed kind of writing this play as you were writing. There's some nice twists and turns. Did did you sort of discover through the writing process the twist where we find out that Marty actually murdered Ron? Was that something you had in mind from the very beginning? Or was were there some things that kind of emerged as you were writing? Um, it was not something I had planned from the very beginning. What I had planned was this kind of philosophical exploration. Um, and we kind of see that through uh, Ron's um, monologues, um, but I felt like I needed the story to go somewhere. And I thought, you know, if you're stuck with someone like Ron your entire life, um, <laughs> how <laughs> eventually maybe someone like Marty might have to do something about that. Um, and she clearly went to an extreme, but yeah, that was not um, originally a part of the story. 
Um, and I guess, you know, your perception of, of, um, of Marty's actions really depends on how you understand her character. Do you see her as someone who you ought to sympathize with, um, having to deal with Ron, or do you see in, you know, do you see her motives as, um, as pure, you know, she did actually care about him and want him to be happy by sending him to a place where happiness is implicit. Um, or is she just, you know, a murderer? <laughs> well, I have to say, I, uh, I sympathize with her <laughs> uh, because Ron, Ron was the kind of person that uh, I think it would take a lot of patience to put up with. <laughs> so thanks a lot, Alex. Um, Thank you. Does some lovely work. And uh, so our next playwright up will be Angelica, uh, The Curse Upon Me. Uh, do we, uh, Angelica. So a question I have for you, Angelica, that came up. Um, when did you first read The Lady of Shalott? I first read The Lady of Shalott when I was in university, and then I ended up doing, writing a paper on it. Okay, because a lot of that sense of it comes through. Um, we, we get a very strong sense of who she is. And I certainly was surprised uh, when I read your script. Um, do you feel that Lydia learns from the dream? Do, do you feel that something in this dream and what happens in this dreamlike encounter um, changes her? Yes, if I had more time, I would have liked to kind of expanded more on like the after. Um, but yeah, the main goal was mostly for Lydia to kind of realize that she's a lot similar to Elaine, um, the Lady of Shalott, than it would appear because the Lady of Shalott seems like very, it's very dramatic, it's like very over the top, but she can still have that similarity. Yeah. Um. And, and there's a real sense of um, when you're trying to create the atmosphere, was this sort of a lucid dream? Is that something that was uh, in your mind for this idea? Because, of course, we do, we do get a sense that she is suddenly pulled into this um, re reenactment. Um, and yet it's got this comic overtone to it with Lancelot coming in and clapping with the coconuts so is there did you did you feel that that comic element was important yes so i wanted to do i wanted to be very much of a comedy in the sense of kind of like um so i, I put in elements of the like monty python and the holy grail so that's kind of where the coconuts and stuff come in because it's very much um like this poem is also like taken uh, like it's another critique from the actual Arthurian legend. So I just wanted to combine all the different elements of the Arthurian legend within it. And I wanted to be very light and comical. Um. I think that because it's, it's so rich and you've got so many elements, um, this could be more than a 10 minute play, absolutely. And I would urge you to, to explore where else it could go because uh, there's just such a rich possibility with the interplay of these characters and using, it's almost like an adaptation in a way of The Lady of Shalott. So thanks so much for that, Angelica. And uh, we'll move on to our final playwright for our little Q&A before we take our break. Um, Gray by Charlie Daze. Charlie, you set up this world so well. And I'm going to, to start with a question that I think we've, we touched on a bit. And this is your fascination with the afterworld and why in particular choose the afterworld as a place to have this kind of psychological examination of gray? For sure. Um, I really, really enjoy writing very human life events that take place in unusual settings. Um, I feel it can really uh, challenge audiences to see things from a different perspective, or it allows uh, themes that may have been um, already covered, you know, in past instances to take on new meanings. Um, so when I was originally writing this piece, I was narrowing in on themes of, you know, uncertainty, um, some kind of emotionally heavier content, and I really wanted a supernatural setting that matched that in tone. 
So I just ended up with a, a therapeutic provider who's operating out of a realm of the deceased. Yeah. And so, and that really, that really sort of grabs our attention because it puts it in a context that we're not used to. So we're, even though we might be familiar with the sort of psychiatrist, psychologist relationship with the patient, we don't know what's going to happen here because it's so different. And I had a question um, passed on to me about, is this possibly a series of pieces in which you examine a particular relationship and issue? Um, could this become um, a bunch of companion pieces? Are you thinking of expanding on it in that way? For sure, I think um, kind of the format as it works at the moment uh, can definitely call for something like that. Um, again, you know, focusing in on the therapeutic providers, there's all sorts of issues that deserve some stage time that um, I think can really be examined in this format. So yeah, for sure. I think it's um, just as a concept alone, something that can be expanded upon. So my last question is about um, the names, Gray, Bones, Gallows. Where, what, what are you exploring specifically with those names in this? Is it just because we're in the afterlife or is there something that each of these characters embodies particularly because of these names? Mm -hmm. um, so for Bones and Gallo, for sure, it's mainly just because um, they're deceased, they're spirits. Um, so I wanted some kind of eerier or spookier names uh, to fit them. And then with Gray, um, I wanted to one, choose a, a gender neutral name for them. And uh, I also wanted a name that kind of had meaning where a lot of times when tackling uh, big issues like the ones covered in this piece, um, there's kind of a sense of wanting to make people feel like there's only two sides and there's no kind of in-between with regards to how people um, experience their identities or how people react. So um, that's why I titled the play Grey as well, um, just to kind of convey not everything is necessarily black and white. Uh, things can be grey and there's, there's always some middle space. Well, that, that kind of answers my final question, but I'll just ask, is there any particular takeaway that you hope people experience from this play? Yeah, I hope just folks know to be, you know, compassionate to whoever they come across. You never know what someone is experiencing. Um, and yeah, I would just say there's, you know, I know this piece is, is heavier emotionally um, mm -hmm. and deals with a lot of uncertainty, but uh, I think compassion is just the way to go. It's the way out. Yeah. And I, I think I would just say finally that you, you d definitely proved that you can deal with heavy emotional issues in a 10 minute play. You can, you can pack that punch. So thank you very much, Charlie. Thanks to all our writers in the first half. And now we're going to break for a short, well, a 10 minute break. And we'll be back with our final three plays of the evening. This is a presentation of Algonquin College Broadcasting. Hi there, and welcome back to our second half. This time we'll offer you three plays. We'll start with Listen for the Crows by Kira Combatley, then Meeting Over Coffee by Samantha Rhodes Mason, Eyewitness by William Irwin. So first up is Listen for the Crows by Kira Combatley. Hello, my name is Kara Combatley and I bring you Listen for the Crows. 
a young mother contacts the church for help when her eldest son has become obsessively attracted to her. Will the church be able to reach him in time and save this family? We soon shall see. Victoria sits asleep in a dark kitchen alone. A single candle in the center of the kitchen table lights the room. Time passes and now in the early morning light, Caleb enters the kitchen. He approaches his mother and touches her face, tucking a hair behind her ear. Good morning, mother. Victoria wakes, pushing his hand away from her. You look awfully tired. Why don't you try laying in bed? Victoria, she ignores him, putting a kettle on as Matthew enters. Mm, morning, mother. Good morning. Victoria gives the boys breakfast and stands off to the side. She looks out the window holding a mug. Why don't you come sit with us? Are we expecting someone? We are. Who's coming over? Father Harris should be arriving this morning. And what do we want with Father Harris? Does he have news of Father? No, he is coming because without your father here, we have very little means of making money. I need guidance, that's all. We can get jobs. Help you. Help you out until he gets home? Very kind, but I don't think there's much work for kids through the winter. Say, if father is not going to return, then I could be him. Take care of y'all by myself. Is that true? Is he not coming home? No, both of you stop. No one needs to be father. Father is father. But, but when is he coming home? Why won't you let me take care of you? Stop it. You are not your father. Both boys look at their mother in shock. Victoria looks back out the window. Mother, where is father? I don't know. But sh surely he wouldn't abandon us. I said I don't know. May I be excused? You may. May I go outside? Yes, but wear a coat. Winter is coming too quickly. We cannot afford anyone getting sick. Are you, are you sure we cannot help? No, my darling. Actually, firewood. While you're out, would you collect some firewood, please? I'm on it! Matthew exits. Why don't you join your brother, Caleb? Victoria collects the breakfast dishes from the table. Caleb watches her. The cawing of crows from outside becomes noticeable. Victoria slumps down in a chair, exhausted. Caleb approaches her, crouching down to her level. Why don't you go lay down? Maybe change in some new clothes. I'll keep an eye out for our guests. Victoria closes her eyes, ignoring him. He reaches and again pushes a hair behind her ear. She pushes him away, gets up, and stands over by the window. Caleb follows after her. Go play outside. Better yet, be useful. Chop some firewood. I could be useful to you in other ways. Caleb caresses Victoria's arm slowly. She again pushes him away, but this time he grabs onto her arm. Let go. Caleb, let go of my arm. The cawing of crows intensifies. Let go now. The crows suddenly stop. Caleb lets go of his mother and smiles widely. He turns, grabs his coat, and heads outside. Victoria trembles as she sits back down. Dear Lord, please help this family. Help my son. A knock on the door startles her. She stands, fixes her long skirt, and answers the door. Father Harris takes off his hat. Father Harris, thank you for coming. I saw your boys out front. They both seem to be growing healthily. Yes, thank you. Please come in. Father Harris enters. I have tea ready. Would you like a cup? 
please, in this weather, it would be lovely. She yes, pours the cups and sits down. Oh, and dear, I am very sorry for your loss. Oh, thank you. Um, may we not talk about that? I beg your pardon? It's just that I haven't told my children yet. I see, Mrs. Johnson. Please, it is Victoria. Of course, Victoria. Is that why I'm here? No. Oh, heavens, no. Then I will not waste your time any longer. Please, tell me the problem. It's my son, Caleb. The older one? Yes, he's 14 now. He seems to be becoming a man already, taller than the both of us. Mm -hmm. Father Harris, um, he's shown signs of impure thoughts. Well, he's c coming of the adolescence age. No. No, it happened very suddenly. You see, on the day my husband passed, Caleb changed. Possibly he overheard. Grief can change a person. Nope. No, nope. I don't think so. In the morning, he was a decent boy and a hard worker. And then around midday, he just, he was a completely different person. We were told of the news weeks later that Frank had died. Victoria, that could mean anything. No. No boy just start, suddenly starts making advances towards his own mother. I swear to you, if it's not the devil inside my son, then his own father is cursed and follow suit. Frank had never been a good man. I'm telling you, when the second war broke out, I prayed he would sign up and I prayed he wouldn't come home. But father... If history is going to repeat itself, then I know that Matthew and I are not safe. What history do you imply? Frank was no saint, but I'm sure you already knew that. Downright woman abuser. Nothing I could say or do would make him respect me, not even just a little bit. Now I'm left with two boys that I can't take care of. I have failed them as a mother, as a parent. I don't know that it was something I did or didn't do as a mother. But I know that Caleb needs help. I am begging you, save this family. Save Caleb before he does something he can't take back. God can save anyone, as long as they allow his goodness inside. Yes, thank you. The chopping of wood, which has been echoing through the kitchen, stops. Then it's settled. I'll take him back to the convent with me. Guide him towards God. Thank you. I understand this will not be easy. Did you have a plan in mind to get him to follow? I'll tell him I'm sending him off to work, that the convent needs strong workers to help keep things running. Not a bad idea as well. I'm sure he is there. We can put him to work. Good. Thank you, Father Harris. Oh, don't thank me. Thank God when he saves your son. Now, let's see what we can do. The front door opens. Caleb stands in the opening, covered in blood. Both Victoria and Father Harris watch with horror. Look, Mother, no need to worry about money anymore. It's just you and me now. The frenzy of crows returns, fade to black. End of play. Hi, I'm Samantha Rhodes Mason. In my play for this evening, Meeting Over Coffee, Grace and Joe do what many who connect online do. They have a first in-person meeting over coffee. They have the privacy of being the only people in the cafe apart from the eavesdropping barista, Tessa. Will there be a connection? I hope you'll enjoy as we find out. A small coffee shop, jazz music plays in the background. Gracie Lee and Joe Brown stand at the counter. There are no other patrons in the shop. A female barista, Tess, finishes her payment. 
You can go grab a table. I'll bring your drinks over in a sec. Grace fidgets nervously with her scarf. Oh, by the way, lovely scarf. Grace absently nods back. Tess begins readying two cups of coffee. From here on, she's eavesdropping on the couple. Grace and Joe take their seats. There's an awkward silence. Thanks for coming out. I really liked your profile. I tried to keep it real, and kudos on your pics. After so many dates with guys who look nothing like their pictures, it's refreshing to find one who does. Actually, you look better in person. Oh, thanks. I keep my picture current. Yours is very flattering. Thanks. Profiles only give the basics. What's your favorite movie? One film? Um, okay, uh, Princess Bride. You? Well, that Fast Times one was awesome. Grace leans forward, intrigued. Mm -hmm. Comedies are always fun. Maybe we can watch one together sometime. Music? I like that. I've missed movie nights with that special someone. Tess approaches the table with their coffee. A mocha latte for the lady, and a double espresso for Moss here. Thanks. Grace sips her coffee. Joe says nothing, although Tess remains nearby. I enjoy stuff you can dance to, like EDM. Okay, so maybe a night at a, dancing at a club sometime. How about beer? I thought your profile said you didn't drink. I'm more of a wine girl, but Guinness for beer? Figures you'd like the stouts. The music changes to chill out EDM. Oh, there's an awkward silence. Well, so what hobbies do you have? You do, oh. Oh, sorry, Wait. you first. What do you do for fun? I like outdoor pursuits. You? to read, but I jog a few times a week. Joe snorts. Tess looks up, intrigued. What? No, oh, just a tickle in my nose. Okay. Um, say, is your name really Brown? That's what it says on my drivers. You want to see it? If you're open. Joe reaches for his back pocket and stops. Oh, I would, but uh, I only brought my billfold today since I walked here. That's okay. I'll believe you. Um, what did you say you did again? I'm in law enforcement. Police officer? No, parole officer. Your profile said uh, you worked in finance, like a bank teller? No, I'm an analyst. I research economic conditions and advise decision makers. It's high pressure and high stress, but I love it. <laughs> Try serving on the front in Afghanistan if you want pressure. Grace crosses her arms. There's an awkward silence. So, you're divorced? Any kids? No, which is probably for the best given how things turned out. What about you? Your profile just says single. Never been married. I see. Any pets or children? No kids that I know of, and no pets. I'm allergic to things with fur. <laughs> I guess you didn't fully read my profile then. I have two cats and a dog. Me too! I love animals. What are their names? You mind? This is a private conversation. You see, how about we take this somewhere more secluded? You know, Joe, um, you're nice and all, but I don't think this will work. I don't feel that spark, you know? No connection. Thanks for the coffee, but... So what, you're just going to leave? Well, yes. I mean... I don't see a reason to drag this out when it's not going to go anywhere. You bitch. Excuse me? Joe notices Tess watching. Didn't I tell you to get lost? 
Tess moves away. You heard me. You women are all the same. Nothing but teases. What? How is meeting you over coffee being a tease? Like you put that sexy bra in your profile pic by accident. What bra in my profile pic? I'm fully clothed. The one hanging on the chair behind you. You know you put it there for us guys to see. You post that invitation and act all open, letting me pay for your drink. But now you won't put out. You think a six-dollar coffee entitles you to sex? Grace quickly digs in her purse and throws a handful of coins on the table. There! Now I don't owe you anything! The music takes an, on an insistent... You're still a bitch, and a friggin' whale, too. I beg your pardon? Like you sport a six-pack? I don't have to take this. Grace starts towards the washroom. Good luck trying to find some other guy willing to bang you. You don't know what you're missing. Grace turning back. What I'm missing? You don't know what you're missing. And good luck keeping any woman with that attitude. I'm thicker than a pop can. What? You think that's a selling point? Wow. <laughs> Just wow. At least I'm not a fat cow. There's a pause. Well, at least this fat cow isn't a deluded misogynist. You can't take rejection, so the best response you can conjure is an insult and not even a very original one. It wouldn't matter if the woman was a size two, you'd still find something to throw in her face. Even if she turned down your masculine godliness, wouldn't you? Well, you can take your fragile ego and cram it into whatever your hole you hole you have that'll fix it. With luck, it'll either choke you or make you wish for lube. Grace throws her remaining coffee over Joe. Joe yells as she shoves his chair his chair so forcefully it falls over. What the hell? Grace heads to the washroom, pausing by Tess. Please. I'll, I'll knock on the door when he's gone, let you know. He's watching, you better go. I'll let you know when the coast is clear. Thanks, um, Tess. I owe you. Grace exits to the washroom. Tess watches Joe, who notices her stare. What are you looking at? You want a piece of this? Watch the step. It can be slippery when wet. Joe exits. Tess knocks on the washroom door. He's gone. Grace enters from the washroom. I'm sorry you had to go through that. What an asshole. He is honestly the worst I've ever met. I'm actually still shaking. Well, thankfully not all guys are like him, and he showed his true colors nice and early. It's worse when they hide it until you're more involved. This time I can move on without regrets. Thanks for the assist. We ladies have got to stick together, right? Grace nods mm -hmm. and heads for the exit. Tess clears her throat. <clears throat> hey, my, uh, my shift ends in a few minutes. You want to grab a coffee? Or maybe go for a run with our pups? <laughs> you mean coffee like what I just went through? <laughs> yes. Uh, no. I mean, yes to getting to know each other, and but without the prick. Grace looks Tess <laughs> over from head to toe, really seeing her for the first time. Well, I've never... Um, well, there was Lucy. You know what? It doesn't matter. Something new might just be what I need. Online dating has been more of a miss than a hit. And you know what? They say about the definition of insanity. So, sure, why not? Okay. Okay, uh, great. Just wait while I finish up. Chill EDM resumes playing. Tess begins shift and tasks, and Grace takes a seat to wait. Lights down. End of play.
And now for our final play of the evening, I Witness by William Irwin. Two criminal friends, Wren and Vince, kidnap a man they call John Doe after he saw the two of them kill a man. Torn about what to do, the two friends argue back and forth. Wren wants to kill John Doe, get it over with, whereas Vince wants to let him go. John Doe is tied to a chair with tape over his mouth. He is sandwiched between Wren and Vince, who are pacing back and forth, arguing with each other. We'll dump him in a river or something. Maybe a vat of acid or something. A vat of acid, really? We're nowhere near one, and even if it were, there's no way a vat of acid isn't guarding all right. And the police, they always end up finding the body. Haven't you ever seen a detective movie? First off, you don't know that. People leave all kinds of weird crap anywhere. And second, yes, of course I've seen a detective movie. Batman doesn't count, dipshit. Batman is not important right now. Take this seriously, for God's sake. If you're going to be a little bitch about this, then fine. Mm. Mm. Sir, please, can you quiet? We're trying to figure out what to do with you. Please don't be nice to this, John. Mm. John Doe? Yeah, so we don't get emotionally attached and not be biased. All right, all right. That's smart. Do you mind? We're in the middle of a very important conversation. Do we have to kill him, Ren? Can't we just like let him go? Yeah, what a brilliant idea. And hey, while we're at it, why don't we give him our license, credit cards, and social security numbers? Maybe even give him our car and not no telling him where to find Richard's body and give him the gun we used to kill him. That's a great solution to this mess we're in, you dumbass. Jesus Christ, you don't have to be a dick about it. Why do you even want to let him, why do you even want to let him live? You were perfectly fine killing Richard. Why draw the line at this guy? I, I don't know, Richard, he had it coming. This guy is just some innocent bystander with a family probably waiting for him. Richard had a wife and daughter who loved him very much. Yeah, and if I found out that some serial killer had a dog that he loved, I, I wouldn't care because it's a goddamn serial killer. Okay, fair enough, but the point still stands. We gotta kill this guy, and soon. Ren pulls out a gun and aims it at John Doe's head. Wait, 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 wait. Let, 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 let's just make a pros and cons list. A pros and cons list? Yeah, yeah. Why not? I'll go first. Okay, good. Uh, pro, we don't have to murder another person. Hmm. Con, mm -hmm. he's seen our faces and is probably going to tell the cops if we release him. <sighs> pro, he doesn't know our names. You called me by my real name a minute ago, Vince. Don't mention mine, you idiot. Ren rips the tape off John's mouth. What? Oh, look, okay, I have a coin in my pocket, and, and if you take it out, you can honestly just flip a coin and get this over with. Are you serious, dude? You know we might have to, like, kill you, right? Yeah, man, I, honestly, this is just taking, taking such a bad turn. I, I really don't know what to deal with this right now, so flip a coin. If I get to live, that's pretty cool, and if not, well, I won't be alive to tell if it's cool or not. Ren reaches into John's pocket and pulls out the coin. Ren flips the coin and it lands on Tails. So what's the outcome? We forgot to choose heads or tails. <sighs> tails, I guess. Ren tosses the coin in the air. The men all look at the coin as it turns, but Ren... Tossed it too far, and the coin lands in John's mouth. No, 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 no! Wait. If he chokes on the coin and dies, then it'll just be an accident. We won't have to feel ba as bad. Are you kidding John me? John accidentally swallows the coin. Are you kidding me again? Fuck. Sorry. 
Okay, you know what? This is getting ridiculous. We're settling this with rock, paper, scissors. If I mm. win, he dies. And if you win, he lives. All right, all right. That sounds fair. Ren sets the gun down on a table nearby. Rock, rock paper, paper, scissors. Scissors! Okay, let's do it again. Rock, rock paper, paper, scissors. Scissors. Are you fucking kidding me? I'm not. Rock, rock paper, paper, scissors. Scissors! <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Some sort of cosmic being messing with us right now? Oh, my sweet Jesus. I want this to be done and over with. I, I'm just going to hold on to this for a while until we figure this shit out, all right? What? Why? It makes more sense for me to have the gun. I mean, think about it. If you want to kill him, uh, what's stopping you from just killing him if you have the gun? But that's my gun. I got it for Christmas. I know, but it's just for now. You can have it back later. Besides, <laughs> we both know you can't handle your temper, dude. Fuck you, yes I can. What? <laughs> Look, it's just for now. Vince carelessly waves the gun around, trying to make his point. Besides, <laughs> if need be, you could always just kill him with something else. The gun goes off and hits John Doe in the head, killing him instantly. Jesus Christ! Holy shit, dude! What? Why'd you do that? It was an accident! Ren takes the gun. You can't just wave a gun around like it's the lightsaber, see? Ren waves the gun around and it goes off again, breaking a window. All right. Well, what's done is done. <laughs> Let's throw him in the river. <laughs> I actually think we should bury him. Okay. Let's rock, paper, scissors for it. Okay, that sounds fair. End of play. <laughs> okay, so our final three plays, and now we'll have a Q&A with uh, Kira, followed by Sam. So first up, listen for the crows. Kira, couple of questions for you. Um, this imagery of crows, is it, we, we talked a bit already about what a group of crows is, a murder of crows, and crows are pretty smart animals, uh, pretty smart birds. Is, is that a parallel for this descent into evil of Caleb? Is the crow kind of his bird? In a way, it, yes. Um, I chose crows because uh, in some religions, it's linked to prophecies or uh, events to for to be foretold. So using crows, it shows that there will be a descent of some sort of negative way, um, obviously to this extent, to murder. Do you think that there's anything Victoria could have done um, either to help Caleb or rescue Matthew? Is there any way she could have seen this coming? Yes and no. I mean, understanding a higher being almost, you know, taking complete control of, you know, a family member is not something that you can predict happening, but in a way, instead of staying at the at the house in the middle of nowhere maybe she should have just grabbed her youngest and left was there any particular myth or legend that inspired the play in the first place yes a little bit i watched the play opedius rex and the prophecy is the son will kill the father and lay with the mother and i didn't really enjoy it because it just creeped me out but um, I thought, what can make it worse? 
by and make it darker is one knowing that it's said mother but i didn't want to copy it so i i changed you know yeah a lot of this stuff just that it, but this all comes together with the idea of fate and yeah. something inescapable yeah um so i'll just ask then uh, i had a question did you always know how the play was going to end or were you started writing and then you were not sure and then eventually you realized through the writing okay this is where it's going mm -hmm. the end of uh, of this play in particular i did have the ending in mind and i kind of worked backwards so yeah okay great and that i think that working backwards is is another way of working it's just sometimes you start and you don't know what the end is other times you do know that there's going to be this fateful ending and you because it's a very strong image that we get the image of blood and the finality and knowing and only knowing through the crows because we don't hear anything from matthew which i think mm -hmm. is is really interesting too we just know that the chopping of wood has stopped and then we hear more from the crows and then we see caleb so you definitely leave us with a very startling image so thank you very much Again, a lot in a 10 minute play. Thanks, Kara. And up next, we'll get uh, Samantha Mason for Meeting Over Coffee. Definitely Hi, a different atmosphere. Hi, Sam. <laughs> uh, and we've had a bit of a conversation about toxic masculinity. Was this kind of a way of exploring that because there is a sudden shock of the change that occurs in our potential date. Yeah, it was it's it's it came up because that, you know um, this is the experience I've had and several of my friends have had going into the online dating is that there's no way initially to even know the difference between somebody who may be a you know toxic male and one who's a genuine nice guy because initially they're all nice guys. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it, 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 I I knew that um, there were these guys out there that had this this aggression and um, this self entitlement. So I wanted to you know put that forth so people could see it. And I'm curious about this whole world of online dating, which <laughs> seems to have a language and a symbolism of its own, because one of the things you bring up is the idea that you know she was talking online and didn't even seem to realize that she had an article of clothing, her bra, yeah. hanging off a chair in the background. Is there a whole language online that is going on <laughs> underneath the communication that people are having? I, I'm sure there is, but I'm gonna tell you that I'm equally clueless on it after being in it. <laughs> it's, uh, um, I, it's, it's, there is a lot like people now with your, all the Zoom conferences, there's always things that can happen in the background that you just don't even know, right? Like we've seen all of these Zoom blunders. So that can happen when you're doing your profile pic or if you're having a chat with somebody online just as easily. Um, and what people are taking away from it, well, you know, that's kind of their thing, not really yours. So I'm, I'm gonna ask a last question. And mm -hmm. it, again, it goes to this whole thing about online dating. You have Tess. Yeah. And through Tess, are you in a sense telling us that with all the online dating, the thing that matters most is the person you meet in person? For the first um, time? And there is a little bit of that. That's the that's the thing. You can do all you want online, but it still comes down to meeting a person live right there to see how you connect with them. Because there's there's always a separation online that you, you just can't really tell if this person is who you want them to be or or who they seem to be online because you can hide so easily um, your real self online. But with Tess, I also wanted to just put out there that sometimes um, finding someone isn't just a question of going to these online things. It's, it's keep your eyes and ears open because there's possibilities all around you if you're just willing to, you know, be receptive. Yeah, which, which actually is the way we used to do it most of the time. <laughs> Keeping yeah, your eyes exactly. and ears open to those serendipitous meetings that take place. 
So um, thank you very, very much. And uh, so Sam, that was great. I want to thank all our playwrights. I also want to extend my thanks to all the performers and again to our fabulous technical crew. And I might say that it was our technical crew that um, sent some of those lovely questions my way for the plays and the playwrights. Um, this is an experiment. We're out of the studio, we're live, and we're doing everything we can to bring you the work of our playwrights, of our actors, and of our broadcasting department. So I'll turn things over for a final good night from Hannah Gibson Fraser. Thank you, Lori. Those questions were really great. And thank you, writers. That was uh, fantastic answers as well. And I, I just want to leave this one with um, uh, with Kira is, was it actually chopping the wood or was it chopping Matthew? That's it. I'm going to leave it there. I can't get that image out of my head. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to start. I want to say thank you. Uh, to Lori uh, for bringing me on board. I love working with you and the students. Students, thank you for trusting me with your work. Uh, it means a lot to me. Um, and you coming forward with your creativity and just being so open with your ideas because without you, actors don't have anything and so on and so forth. So we need each other. Um, also, going to our technical team, thank you so much for the television broadcasting program. Uh, and today, special shout out for Jillian, Elena, Alicia, and Alex. Uh, you have been all in and so grateful for all of your hard work. Uh, you've made this e evening possible for our writers and we're incredibly grateful for your time and effort into this. So once more, I am going to thank our performers for volunteering their time tonight. So thank you, Chantel Roy, Rosalia Red, Jamie Sadgrove, Xander Storm. Without you, of course, this would not be possible. And don't worry, we still have Mark Templin and Vincent Valentino. Don't forget Fruitcake the Cat in there. Uh, and myself, I guess. But it's been a joy working with you all. Um, so please make note that our next Hot House will take place on Monday, March the 29th, right here on YouTube at 7 p.m. Uh, be ready, bring your popcorn, bring a drink, bring what, you don't have to go far. Uh, this will be our last hot house of 2021. So just be sure to be ready and we can't wait to see you then. Have a wonderful evening and thank you so much. This has been a presentation of Algonquin College Broadcasting.